And welcome to Investment Agriculture Foundation's inaugural virtual pitch night, Ramp Up 2022. And I would like to, my name is Mike Mannion, as most of you know, uh, the program manager and EIR for the Ramp Up program, and your host for this evening's event. And again, thank you all for taking the time to join us and participating in our uh, event this evening. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge that I live, work, and play on the unceded and traditional territory of the Katsi Nation here in Pitt Meadows, and I welcome you to recognize the traditional territory where you are located as well this evening. At this time, I would like to introduce Michelle Kosky, CEO of IAFBC, to uh, say a few words. Michelle, welcome. Thanks, Mike. Um, good, ev good evening, everyone. It's uh, very nice to see you all. And thank you, as Mike said, for taking the time. Um, my name is Michelle Kosky, and I am the CEO of IF. Um, IF is a not-for-profit, and we specialize in the delivery of provincial and federal government programs across BC. Our membership and board of directors represent all of BC's agriculture and agri-food sectors. I'm very pleased to be here tonight for Ramp Up. It's a new pilot program um, that's being funded by the Ministry of Agriculture and Food. And I'm so pleased with the progress to date. And I'm hopeful that this pilot program will turn into a more lasting and sustainable program that supports the kind of innovative and talented entrepreneurs that are pitching here tonight. So I wish you all the best of luck. Um, I would like to thank Mike Mannion and the Ramp Up team. He's been a uh, strong lead in all of this, as well as some of my staff, Chris Reed and Abby Morris, um, who have been working and putting efforts into uh, getting tonight's events together. And I also would like to very much thank the Ministry of Agriculture and Food for funding and supporting the Ramp Up initiative. So with not, I won't say too much longer. Um, I'm not sure, Mike, if I turn it over to you or over to Chris to introduce the judges. But again, thank you all for being here and best of luck. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I just have a few words uh, before we get to uh, Chris. Um, so tonight you'll be witnessing the pitch presentations from the six finalists in our cohort one ag tech accelerator. These successful graduates of the market validation training program, which was led by David Christie, our trainer. And they were selected from a group of nine original companies that had joined the program back in January. These finalists have been working diligently with us at Ramp Up uh, on their go-to-market strategies. And uh, they basically have completed two segments of the program. The first segment is two months of intense training with David Christie as their trainer, followed by three months of specialized coaching uh, led by Rob Arthurs, who's with us tonight. Rob, nice to see you, and myself. And, uh, and through that, we have developed a, a criteria for how they will be scored this evening. And so working in collaboration with Rob and David, we have scored the six companies on, on their development in three areas. One is what we refer to as a customer readiness level. Many of you have, will be aware of the technology readiness level. And what we've done is, is we borrowed from that uh, to make it a little bit more appropriate for companies that may have more of an innovation than a technology. As well, they are scored on their participation in the program, how they attended sessions and whether or not they got their homework done in a timely manner. And third, their engagement through the specialized coaching as to how, how prepared they were in, in determining their priorities for uh, after work and, uh, and to ensure that, uh, that they are, were fully compliant with all of our requests. These three areas will represent 40% of their total mark. The final 60% will be based on their participation this evening as scored by our esteemed group of judges who are on the, many of them are with us this evening. 
at this time, I would like to introduce Chris Reed, uh, Business Development and Strategic Initiatives Director from IFBC to introduce our board members. Go ahead, Chris. Hi, Mike. Yeah, Mike, can you, uh, can you hear me? We can. Excellent, thanks. Um, I think what I'll do tonight uh, to introduce the, the members is I'll just, um, I'll call out their names because I'm afraid I can't see everybody on uh, on the screen tonight. And I think it might just be nice for the directors to just do a brief introduction of themselves so that their face will pop up and uh, the participants will get to see to see them as well. So um, I'll just go through the roster and it's it's also self-serving for me because then I get to take attendance of, of which directors are here tonight. So um so I'll start with uh, Deb Henderson. Are you on the call tonight, Deb? Can, and if you are, can you just say a couple of brief words about yourself, please? Yes, I am, Chris. Um, I'm Deborah Henderson. I direct the Institute for Sustainable Horticulture at Kwantlen Polytechnic. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I, I work and live on the ancestral unceded lands of the, Quant of the Coast Salish people, including the Kwantlen, after whom we are named, the Stolo, Semiamu, and Tawasin. Um, the Institute is a an, a research and development institute that works with um, a lot of startups in the agricultural innovation area. Great, thanks very much, Deb. Uh, David Chere, are you on the call tonight? Yes, uh, I am, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is David Chere. I'm a uh, sector manager at Team in British Columbia, and my focus area is in the agriculture and agri-food space. Thank you. Okay, thanks, David. Oh, uh, Mike, one thing to maybe uh, pass on is I got a quick note from Tom Urban says he's in a waiting room. So I'm not sure if you were able to let him in or not tonight. Um, or maybe just check and make sure uh, you could admit okay. it. Mitchell, I'll leave that to you. Uh, moving on with our list of panelists. Uh, Sandra, where are you on the call tonight? And if so, good evening. And could you say a couple of words about yourself, please? I am. Hi, everybody. Great to be here. Uh, my name is Sandra Ware, and my background is in tech. Uh, Two-time entrepreneur, now turned in term exec with early stage or later stage companies. And I've worked with Mike in the past, so looking forward to tonight's event. Thanks, Sandra. Good evening. Uh, and Robert Napoli, are you on the call tonight? Good evening. Hello. Sorry. Just finding my mute button. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Napoli. Um, I'm a CA. I've worked in finance my whole career. Uh, on the uh, other side of the table from entrepreneurs, uh, investing and lending. And then uh, more recently, I've become CFO at Cascadia Seaweed. Um, so thanks for having me. Great. Thanks very much, Robert. Um, Tom, uh, if, you're, if you're out of the waiting room and on the call, uh, love you introduce yourself, please. He is, he is not. Uh, we will uh, we will be back to you in a second. We, we just have to. We don't have a waiting room, so we're not sure where he's <laughs> okay. where he's waiting. Well, uh, uh, Chris and Mike, it's Jim here. I had forgot you had sent out emails a couple of weeks ago with the with the specific panelist. So it it took me a minute or two. So maybe someone might have to remind Tom that I know he wasn't on the call last week. So mm -hmm. he might not be aware of that. And I'll, could be I'll send him a quick note. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Jim. And uh, since we just heard from you, Jim, do you want to say a few uh, few words about yourself and introduce yourself to the group? Sure. Yeah, I'm vice chairman of um, IAF, and my uh, my daytime my daytime job is CEO of Rayma Health Products. Great. Thanks very much, Jim. And I'm not sure if uh, Nana Colette is on the call or not. I didn't see her name. In no, the she sent her regrets. Oh, sure. she did. It. Okay. So uh, the only one we're waiting for then is, um, I believe, is Tom Urban. So we can always get him to say a couple of words when he joins in. I, I have arrived. I have arrived. Oh, there you are. Good. Well, there you are. Well, good evening, Tom. Um, we were just going through the, the list of uh, advisors tonight and getting them to say a couple of words about themselves for the panelists. So if you could go ahead and do that, it would be appreciated. Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so Tom Urban. So I spent my operational career in the seed business. Um, with Pioneer Hybrid uh, and then subsequently DuPont on the corn and wheat side. Uh, and then I joined an early stage company as a CEO of a forestry genetics company, uh, forestry seedlings, and ended up uh, selling that to uh, our, our biggest U.S. competitor. And for the last 10 years, I do two things. I'm an entrepreneur in residence at UBC, so I work with all the startups coming out of that program. Uh, but mostly, 
I'm an, I invest and advise uh, early stage ag companies, um, have about 25 investments. Uh, I'm active either on the board or as an advisor in probably half of those um, and really enjoy ag and love to already see a little bit about what you guys are doing and looking forward to the presentations. Great. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, and, and with Tom joining us uh, now, I think that's the uh, entire uh, panel of advisors. So uh, back over to you, Mike. Okay. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, judges. Um, just to go over the criteria again, uh, each of the judges tonight has been given a, a checklist so that they may score the individual presenters on a variety of topics. After tonight's event, the scores will be collated and together with the other inputs that I had previously described uh, will be used to determine the final two winners of the $25,000 business development grants. Um, I, uh, I presume that it will be sometime this week that those winners will be announced for us to be determined. Okay. So without any further ado, uh, just a, a bit of a clarification for you. All of the events or all of the presenters tonight have sent us a pre-recorded pitch that they, that, uh, they will play. And after the pre-recorded pitch, they will come on live to be available to answer your questions. Okay. Mike, I, I have a quick question about scoring, but I don't want to interrupt your flow if you still have a couple of things you wanted to tell no, us. No, go ahead. So uh, on the scoring sheet, do we just tabulate on our own the total out of 30 based on the components that were shared in the Word doc? Yes, Chris, that's the, uh, that's the plan. That's the plan, yep. Okay. Okay, with that uh, out of the way, we are now over to the first presenter, which is Vitality. And Christopher Mark is the presenter. Go ahead, Mitchell. Hello and welcome. My name is Christopher Mark and I'm the founder of Vintality. So what is Vintality? Well, we're a precision viticulture and kind of technology focused company that seeks to marry this new technology with the best of farming practices, not to abandon what's been done in the past, but to really improve it. And we have a two pronged business model. And what we do is we use our consulting precision viticulture work, we flying UAVs, helping with vineyard design layout, soil mapping, all of this to fund the R&D arm, what we believe is a scalable and high potential arm of the company. So this is what's allowed us to create the FERT box, which we're talking about today. We just received $200,000 for a precision irrigation system we're developing. And what happens is our customers, our work and our revenue fund the ideas, the concepts, and obviously financially the develop, tech development we're seeking to do, the opportunities we see. And we think this means that we're really well placed. There are kind of three major trends in the, in the wine industry globally right now, which is very much is at play in BC and the rest of North America. I'll just quickly touch on two. The first is climate. A lot of people don't realize the severity of impact France in 2022 is expected to lose over $2 billion in wine sales because of lost harvests. As well, we've seen a real push towards premiumization that comes from demand as boomers have gotten older, but also millennials and Gen Z have a high demand for premium products. And there's also an internal push from the industry for towards premiumization, which rewards companies that are focusing on improving quality in the face of climate change, especially. And again, we're an operating company. Uh, we've been operating for three years. We were working, if you're a wine lover in BC, you're going to recognize a bunch of these names. We really work with some of the top notch wineries and vineyards as well, not on this list to help them make better product. And that's again, where our ideas are coming from. This allows us to go to our clients and really makes the R and D process a lot easier and more efficient. And here's just some testimonials. Again, just speaking to the reputation we have both in the industry and with our clients, I think around 80% of our clients are repeat clients. And even some of those that fall away is just, you know, temporarily and they'll, they'll come back to work with us. So on that note, let's hit the first box. I'm going to show you a video and we'll come right back.
So what's the problem that the fruit box is addressing? What's the challenge? And the challenge is that currently, unlike in broad acre agriculture, in vineyards, and also in orchards as well, there is no good accurate way to dispense nutrients you kind of have two systems you've got a fertigation system and what that means is just the irrigation it's the pvc piping that runs along each vine you run liquid nutrients through that or you're doing granular think again what you're doing with when you're spreading nutrients on your lawn you know with that little spreader same idea and that's what we see here that's a granular spreader that coon and so they're big challenges but with both neither are accurate you cannot be targeted you it's really hard to change a granular spreader as you're going along, you just kind of set it and then you drive. Also, it's really affected by speed. A lot of them do not have speed adjustments and fertigation. You can only do it by block. It's just not cost effective to be targeted with fertigation to any degree. And so kind of blocks are all or larger are fertigated themselves. So there's just no good solution. And this poses a lot of challenges right now in vineyards. And I'm just going to touch on too quickly environmental pollution is I don't think, again, it's hard to appreciate once how much of an issue uh, nitrogen and other pollution is nitrogen is being the number one uh, pollutant, both in terms of carbon emissions, but also polluting waterways. And there's a real over application because of the challenges we just talked about. I'll also, just quickly say a lot of people outside the industry, um, balance sounds kind of, well, what's the big deal, but it is actually the number one complaint we hear from our clients because you can't, you have to, you have to, uh, adjust things at different rates so you, if you if plants are ripening at different rates if health varies that takes a lot of specific management a lot of labor time and money and so achieving balance is a major major demand for vineyards and our solution as you saw in the video it's the fruit box it is able to fertilize each vine on a vine by vine basis every vine in the vineyard with a liquid fertilizer can get its own custom blend uh, what you saw is an operating prototype we're just starting to rent it out right now this year so it it's working we're getting great results uh, as we'll briefly talk about a little bit later and here's the benefit it's really the inbox the inverse of what we saw with challenges there's a couple more points but i'll just quickly say that in terms of reducing fertilizer use china right now is really leading the charge here because they've seen and lived the impact of over fertilization both in terms of environmental impact and cost and it's coming around the world so what does the market look like well, there are 282 licensed winery, grape wineries in BC. That is not vineyards. There are actually about 1,049 vineyards. That was in 2019. Uh, all this data is 2019 and that all has grown. Uh, so the again, the potential size is quite significant, but BC is tiny. It's very small compared to, it's roughly one-tenth the size of just Washington, which as you can see is much smaller than California. And this is just in North America. We don't have Oregon, France, Italy, other wine regions in the world. So the market is quite significant in terms of demand for these generally speaking type of products. And you'll see here, we have a real clear idea of our ideal customer. I'm not going to get into it right now. They're early adopters because we have some really good data on what's happening in terms of the effect of the FERC box and the effect even for a non-premium, very average vineyard, the, you know, with a very small being very conservative and the difference we're making it can be the financial impact can be quite significant. I'll, I can't write this down for obvious reasons, but I can say that based on our research with UBC in our first year, that was last year, we saw a 30% reduction in nitrogen with no impact on yield or quality and the other fertilizers we used as well. We improved their presence within the vine. So again, improved vine health uh, quite a bit over everything else. So we're seeing uh, the effect and we have hard data to demonstrate that. Let's quickly talk a bit about sales. We kind of, again, have a three pronged model. The major is going to start with direct sales for smaller customers. We might be leasing or renting or working with a, a consultant and where real growth is, is we're going to have a lot of data come out of this that we're going to be handling. And those are obviously real AI data management subscription opportunity. We have great relationships. As you can see, we've targeted kind of a number of allies conceptually, and we found those partners in BC and have been working with them. So again, there's excitement about what we've done and what we're building. We also have a real strong presence. We've got a podcast blog. All of this is, we have a very widely read industry newsletter called BC Wine Weekly. We hold webinars. Uh, we're really well connected and known within our industry. And again, here you can see the value chain. We, our revenue model is we really see direct sales early on. 
uh, at a sale price of very roughly 50k with a rental price of 500 dollars a day driving most of the sales but then moving to more subscription and other ancillary services that come with this product this is an estimate again kind of based on rough sales with 2024 the idea to be expanding outside of bc so we see an initial move in bc and then by 2024 sales and everything moving out beyond that into north america and beyond again also as we expand our sales there's no direct competition for what we're doing there's no current product at all that can do what we do there's just nothing that has this precision viticultural component uh, but the best comparison is foliar sprayers, which have an average sale price of 30 to 75K uh, or more. And that's again in Canadian dollars. And the exciting part is that market is really growing, expected to reach 7.4 billion by 2025. And so there's high demand. Almost every vineyard of any size has one. So where does that leave us? So you kind of have an idea of where we're at in terms of revenue. Um, we've received, but how about funding? And we've received quite a bit of funding from different organizations. Um, you know, this has been really exciting. I think, again, a lot of this has come because we've got strong industry support. We've got letters of, of support from research labs, from industry associations, from specific vineyards on what we're doing. And that's allowed us to receive a lot of external funding and on top of that, self-fund the rest, which has allowed us to keep it in-house. And I think speech speaks to uh, the excitement over what we're doing. And I'll just end by saying, there's a lot of space to grow. There's a lot of places we can take this. Uh, once you're using something of this technology, I think a foliar sprayer is the next big step. So that's where we're at. I would just like to say thank you. We are really excited about what we have, what we're developing and the relationships we have. Super, thanks, Chris. Okay, it's now open to questions from the judges. And, uh, uh, Go ahead, Robert. I see your hand up first. Yeah, thank you. Excellent presentation. It's a, a very interesting product. Um, can I ask what intellectual property you have over the product? Uh, what can you protect here? Because it looks like something that's uh, something that could be that will will be copied. Yeah, great question. Thanks, Robert. So we're currently going through the process with uh, an IP lawyer. So we're kind of saying right now it's patent pending. Um, the what really is patentable is the output. So we have a custom built algorithm um, that we've used that generate, you know, that kind of takes everything and, and um, you know, all the fertilizer decides where it goes. And so it's kind of that mechanism between the algorithm, like that gray box you kind of saw in the back is just packed with computer chips and all this hardware I could honestly not even explain to you. Luckily we have a, an engineer for that, but that's the, that's the component that's patentable. And so we're going through that. I think one of the other advantages we have is this falls under, you know, or it should fall under a green technology. That's our expectation because of, like we've said, our early data is showing that we can reduce fertilizer use uh, pretty significantly, which obviously has a pretty significant climate impact. I think you're muted there, Mike. <laughs> Thanks, Christopher. Sandra, you're next. Um, uh, I see your hand next, so Great. go ahead. Okay, so I have a multi-part uh, question. So first off, your what's the status of your product currently? Because you said you'd gotten some good feedback. Is it market ready, or is it still at like you know proof of concept pilot stage? Yeah, we're kind of right on the cusp there because we we're actually just starting to rent it out. So on Wednesday, we're taking it to a vineyard that's not part of our research trial to operate it. So it's operating the thing we, I think, to be honest, we need to nail down is just the ease of use. So it's completely operatable. We've got good, reliable data in terms of output, uh, safe to use, you know, uh, safe, I mean, in terms of for the vineyard that they know the output they're getting. So we kind of have all the da data in terms of operation. The video you saw of that unit, uh, it could go operate in any vineyard right now and produce those results. Um, you know, the next step, I think it's just a practical one is just to simple, you know, you know, just to simplify it a little bit. And that'll be as we sell the unit, our next one, we kind of have all that put together. So it just is really, I guess what I'm saying is a matter of creating another unit. So I think we're ready to start selling. And the next part is you talked a little bit about your ideal customer. I'm curious about what your ideal customer would be using today and then what would be required of them to get up and running to use yours, including, you know, you know, if they have any sort of agreements with uh, vendors 
for the services you could be substituting. Yeah, so answer that. Please uh, just interrupt me if I'm kind of missing answering that question fully. The um, currently what they're using, so a bunch of, you know, we have some clients that try and do precision fertilization. And so what they'll do is they'll literally have a granular fertilizer, which again, is just a big tank. It's kind of like, like I said in the video, what you push on your lawn. So it's just kicking it out. Some of you may be familiar with that. And they'll have their driver just ease up or slow down. Um, one of the things we do is we do um, drone multi-spec. And so they'll use that just to dump some extra compost or something like that. So they'll use maps we give them just to help them decide where to put a little bit of extra fertilizer, compost, whatever. Um, that's pretty much it. That's all they can do right now. It's really inaccurate and they know it. Um, in terms of getting set up, I mean, there's, you know, really there's nothing. The, the big hurdle for our ideal customer is it's just uh, obviously outside of the educational component, continuing to educate them about the, the product to actually, you know, the product itself, but to use the product, it's just, we need an input from them, right? So it's often soil sampling, which is easy, but if it's just soil sampling, that's expensive. Um, if it's other things, it's that they need to work with us in terms of identifying errors, they want more or less fertilizer. Um, so for our ideal, you. yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, just to finish that, I was just gonna say for our ideal customer right now, that's usually not an issue because that's what they want to do. They want to be more involved. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, Deborah, you're next on my screen. Thanks, Mike. Um, nice presentation, Chris. Thank you. Um, I, maybe some of my question has already been answered, but um, is it adaptable? Like, is are you just applying liquid, or are you applying liquid and granular, or um, like what is the state of it, status of it right now? Yeah, so it's just applying liquid, um, which is kind of just the plan, just because we looked at doing granular, and it becomes this massive mechanism, which is why there aren't any real options for accurate granular than I know of, because to control with the level with the accuracy, it's just not possible with a mechanism where you have various different sizes of round of fertilizer, that clump. And, and so we couldn't get anything accurate enough. So it's liquid. Um, and it's like I said, it's operating. Um, and the next step, which we're working on this year is actually just to build a foliar attachment of the edge, which I think is really the is going to be huge because it kind of gives it a year round use that way. So it just would be an attachment on the back um that would then allow you to spray uh foliar your liquids as foliar as well so um you you're, you do you look at someday being able to um work with organic growers who have like totally different profiles and of soil and and mechanisms and and inputs yeah thanks deborah that's actually a great question i wish i'd put that in the video now um yeah we can do organic right now so we can spray part of the original idea was to was so that we can do organics we were for example just um, uh, the vine one of the vineyards we're doing the trial with, they wanted to use it on a bunch of uh, blasted church on a bunch of their other vineyard. And so we put fulvic acid, for example, which is commonly used uh, in organic systems. And so, yeah, no, we can um, effectively, yeah, we can, as long as it's a liquid, we can spray it uh, for fertilizers. Yeah, so, so they, they sometimes not everything can be liquid, but um, you, you're, I think I understand you're using your soil test to um, decide where, um, where different applications go, right? Yeah, so it, it's input agnostic. So we, because we're kind of viticulturalists, we do a lot of soil testing, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's just for, uh, what we think is often the best, but you can use anything to kind of decide what you want to put out. So it can be input from the grower and you can kind of combine these different layers. It can be like the, uh, what's NDVI we do. So drone flights, it can be where you've seen, like we've seen a lot of cutworm this year uh, in the vineyard. So it could be, areas with cutworm you want to spray more so it's kind of input agnostic but we often use soil tests because it's effective okay and and you can change the information from a soil test on an organic field because you know sometimes the nitrogen you know is doesn't is, is not immediate release and you can yes. program that yep. in exactly so it's kind of we have the we have seven tanks right now so kind of four macro three micro although we um tanks and so it'll just be we can determine the kind of rate we want because also different products change, right? Even if we're just spraying magnesium, different magnesium products will require different rates. Um, so we can adjust that too. So, um, and to your other point you made about, uh, yeah. So in terms of organic, if it's not liquid, then yeah, we're not doing, so you, we can't do it. So if it is like a compost or something like that, but actually on our to-do list is to make it compostable, spreadable. It won't have the same level of accuracy because of the nature of compost, but we should actually be able to have a spreader attachment on the back in the future. Thank you. Okay, and Tom. Hi, Chris. 
I've been I've been sitting here and had way too many questions actually coming up in my uh, in my brain. So I'm going to stick to two. Um, it's really around kind of value proposition and uh, and go to market. And so the you're saying I'm going to sell the machine for fifty grand or I'm going to charge you five hundred dollars a day. Um, those are fundamentally different approaches to how you get your product to market and how you describe your value proposition and whatnot. Are, is it, is, have we decided or is it at the option or how do you think about those two things? And then very related, why 50 and why 500? Yeah, so um, to answer the first question, you know, these aren't firm numbers yet um, in part because, you know, we've, Tweet, we're tweaking the final product. So once we get the full year sprayer, that's going to change our numbers a bit. So um, where the $500 is coming from, that's kind of what you're going to rent out right now, a high-end fertilizer spreader for, which is not as good as our unit. So it's probably, it might be a little bit low actually, but that's on the upper end of what the market is paying right now. Um, the $50,000 again is kind of based on market research of where we're coming under some of the really high-end full year sprayers. Um, but that I think that number will go up based on, uh, once we have a foliar sprayer attachment, again, I think that changes the value prop, uh, I, you know, as well. So those were those numbers are coming from. In terms of firmness, I mean, this is part of what we're navigating right now. This is where we're having conversations with our clients, with potential clients about it right now in the Okanagan Valley to kind of decide, you know, how well we, we have some flexibility in how we implement this, uh, that business model in terms of direct sales and leasing and renting. But I think too, what we want to hit is two different channels because there's a lot of vineyards that, especially in BC, which is less true down South that are not going to be able to afford a unit. So we want to be able to attack that market. And that may be actually rather than leasing and renting at $500, maybe it's coming more through consultants, you know, who are, who are purchasing our product and using it, uh, you know, as they go spray a bunch of vineyards. For example, we have a company here called Earl Co, which does a lot of vineyard management. So maybe it's them buying a couple of units uh, instead of leasing and renting, but some are interested in doing that with some of these specialty products. Uh, hopefully that's. So, so, so my last comment, and, and maybe it's because you didn't have the time or, but, but in terms of the value proposition, again, we're talking about reduced labor. We're talking about improved yield. We're talking about fewer input costs. Um, I, I, I didn't, I didn't hear any numbers. And, and I don't know how many side-by-side -side comparisons you've done to have any substantial data, not just at UBC, but in the field. I'm not going to, I think it's a too long an answer, but when I hear it, man, do I want to dig into that because that is really, really hard to substantiate. Yeah, I'll just really quickly answer the, when I, when I reference the UBC, that is in Chris, the field data. Chris, sorry uh, oh, okay. uh, for interrupting. We're, we're just at the edge of our, our time. So if you could just briefly close that out and we'll move on. Yeah, all I'll say is that all the data I reference is in the field from operating in a vineyard. Uh, I just mentioned UBC because we're partnered with them on a research trial. So this is data that is objective. It's going to go into a research paper. Um, I think I can valid. I think I can substantiate a lot of those numbers. Uh, maybe I should, you know, maybe you're right, Tom. I should have done so in the presentation. Uh, and I'll, but I'll stop there. Good. Thank you very much, judges. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, I'm sorry uh, we may have missed uh, one of the judges' questions. Uh, in the in the next, uh, we will we will try to ensure that they all get heard. Um, moving on, our next presenter is Jonathan Kitson from Demazine Tech. Jonathan, it's over to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, really appreciate being here, and thank all the guys at the Ag Tech Wrap Up, and uh, certainly Mike, Dave, Rob. I am actually would like to acknowledge that I'm on the unceded territory of the Musqueam. Um, I will roll into my video because it kind of says Go ahead, Mitchell. what it's supposed to. Hi, my name is Jonathan Kitson. Thank you for attending my presentation. I am with Mullen Nation, a division of Demazine Technology, and I'm here today to talk about a product we've developed around the plant Mullins. But our story begins actually many, many years ago with my wife, because my wife got very sick. I think I had COVID. I was diagnosed with pneumonia, um, and I had quite a bit of chest congestion. Actually, it was the worst I've had in my entire life. I couldn't breathe. Um, I couldn't sleep, I was coughing a lot, and uh, I couldn't take a deep breath. And my husband gave me Mullins, and 
right away I could feel my chest open up and I was able to breathe deeply and sleep and actually shortly thereafter my symptoms improved. So this got me thinking, if there's this market maybe for this Mullins, why aren't other people doing it and why haven't I seen it all over the place and why is it so hard to find and come by on the internet? And more importantly, how did it ever get to North America because it's not even a native plant? And what I discovered was this really fascinating story. The story of Mullen starts more than 3,000 years ago when Sicilian merchants took this amazing plant from Thepos in Italy to Greece. Mullen was investigated as a plant medicine and Dias Cordes included Mullen in his famous five-volume medicinal guide more than 2,000 years ago. Mullen was then the go-to plant for tuberculosis, bronchitis, and all breathing disorders. Word of the plant spread all through Europe and Asia. By the Middle Ages, Mullen was considered one of the 23 most important medicinal plants by Jewish healers. History tells us that the Puritans came from Europe to settle in the Americas. What is overlooked is that they actually took Mullen with them 500 years ago as a means of treating tuberculosis. Mullen has been studied extensively and found to be anti-inflammatory, antiviral, antibacterial, anti-cancer, and can even be used to heal wounds. Scientists have documented seemingly endless uses for thousands of years, and today there are well over 15,000 journal articles that mention Mullen. Why, you ask, don't we see Mullen everywhere? The big reason is that it's commercially grown in just two locations. India, which contains so much lead it must carry a warning label, and Croatia, which has the highest amount of organic fraud in Europe. Production is rather small. Hi, my name is James and I work with Demazine Technology. Right now we're going, growing Great Mullen, Verbascum thapsus, and we'll be growing that for the next two years. We get the question a lot of the time, why don't other people grow this crop? Well, one reason is because it takes twice as long as other crops. Corn, wheat, soy, popular crops usually take one year. This one takes twice as long, and that's a lot more effort. The mullen starts as a super tiny seed. It's only half a millimeter in size. It's too tiny for mechanical planting, so we have to give it a coating in order to make it larger so it can be commercially planted. The mullen grows at first into a small ground-hugging rosette approximately 20 centimeters wide. After the first winter, it returns in spring to start again. Now in its second year, it grows to a height of nearly two meters and produces a one meter long series of flowers. Mullen is very drought tolerant and also resists animal consumption because it is covered by fine hairs, which don't taste good. At harvest, the flower and root and leaves are separated from the stalk. We run the flower through our own custom designed separator to remove it from the stalk. The flower, leaves, and root are then run through an extra fine grinder that reduces the size of the plant to under 10 microns. Those little hairs are all ground up and it is now ready to be made into products. When we were first accepted to the AgTech Accelerator, we pitched a product made from mullen that could compete directly against traditional matcha drinks. Mullen tastes similar and matcha commands a very high retail price, but not everyone drinks tea. After conducting our own consumer surveys and looking at hundreds of online reviews from Mullen, we realized there was a far greater potential. Many people were looking for a food additive for smoothies or cooking and none currently existed. So we expanded our market with a slightly different product. But there was yet another consumer market, predominantly people with COPD, who were typically over 50, current or former smokers, or the elderly, and for that group, a candy or cough drop was the best form factor. All three products are derived from the same grinding process, but from different parts of the plant. We have a mix of different IP and brand strategies, trademarks and brand identity, patents, such as on our mechanical separator, trade secrets such as coating the seeds and our fine grinding process. Quality and trust, made in Canada and organic, is very important to some people. Supply, quite simply, nobody can compete if they don't have supply, and right now the supply is very limited and from very unreliable sources. If we scale quickly, we can simply dominate the market and it will take two years for everyone else to catch up. 
Our plan is to concentrate the company on the core business, which is making and marketing product. We will pay organic farmers to grow mullein. At harvest, the farmers will use our mechanical separator, which we will provide. We will then distribute the product to co-manufacturers for the grinding and packaging into our products. We will manage inventory and focus on marketing and revenue growth. There are multiple markets for our product, each of which is massive and underserved. We are targeting specifically people with breathing issues. Just COPD is a $52 billion a year market, and patients in the USA are paying two to 600 a month for medication. Then there's asthma and sickness such as COVID and chronic bronchitis, all of which are huge markets. Let's not forget that mullein is a superfood, antioxidant, antiviral, antibacterial, and perfect product to add as a booster if we can make enough of it to entice drink chains. And now, let's look at the numbers. $500,000 investment produces 20 acres of mullins at approximately 125K. 200,000 is processing and overheads. 175,000 goes to marketing, which is also gonna be subsidized by the Trade Commissioner's Office. Yield is 24 metric tons over two years. Retail value, better than $9 million. Certainly a good return on investment. But if we can raise 5 million, we can put in 200 acres and then we have enough product to launch a more massive campaign. This would yield nearly 240 tons of mullein. Gross revenue would top out at 50 million plus a year and push the company to be a unicorn with a 20x evaluation. It would also allow Canada to be the go-to country for mullein. So why invest? Well, if you never wheeze or cough and you don't know anyone who does, then you probably don't need mullein but you probably do need your hearing checked. This product has 3,000 years of testimonials. 3,000 years. Ulysses, you know that guy Ulysses? Ulysses carried mullen with him. And if it's good enough for Ulysses, the pilgrims, and tuberculosis, maybe we all should be paying attention. Thank you for listening. Breathe easy, mullen is coming. Okay, questions for Jonathan. And uh, Sandra, your hand is up first. Yeah, um, so I, I, I wasn't familiar with Mullen, so it was really interesting. But, and I understood the ag part. The Delta for me was the tech. What is the proprietary or technology aspect of um, this? Mostly it's in two things. It's in the, uh, it, it Mullen, the plant. I mean, I'm sure you might have seen it around. It's actually very hard to separate from the stalk, and the stalk is very, very uh, woody. Um, and you actually mechanically, there's no real mechanical separation right out there right now. People are basically doing it by hand. So that limits how you can scale the product. So if you look at how it's being grown right now, there are people growing it. I mean, there's sort of probably thousands of people, but they're growing it on like very small, like half acre, quarter acre plots to, to do their own small micro businesses. And that really comes down to the fact that they can't scale it and grow it. So what we do is we have a mechanical separator, which does work. We've actually got another generation of that coming out. My company actually has uh, three full-time mechanical engineers and two electrical engineers on staff. So we're actually very much on a, a physical product orientation. So we've been iterating through that. We feel that we'll have a next generation one in the next couple months that will basically do what we want, which is to pull the flowers off more efficiently and also separate the leaves as well. Cause we want to take that into a separate product rather than just mixing it into one because the leaves specifically grind finer. So you can sell it as like a matcha drink and it actually does taste like a traditional matcha. Whereas the uh, bract in the flower is actually never quite gets as, as fine a grind. So it's better as like a food additive. You can throw it into a smoothie and stuff. It doesn't have that same, like um, it, it's, it tastes similar, but the, the feel of it is never quite the same. Thanks. So just to clarify, what's unique for you guys is how you process it. When you so it's the Indian process crunching. inside, yeah. And then also the grind. And the grind, we're doing a uh, kind of a modify, modification of what they would do in a traditional matcha, which is to get it like sub 10 microns uh, to get a, a fine Perfect. grind out of it. Thank you. And interestingly enough, nobody's in Canada does that. Um, I found like five places in the U.S. who are actually able to grind that fine. So at least from a standpoint of bringing it to Canada, we're doing that. And then we're modifying those machines uh, slightly to allow us a better grind quality to get better yield. Um, 
but it's really those two proprietary things which will gives us really what we're at, really in a scale model and then you know then we have obviously this food product uh one of which is a real food which is the uh the drop and then the second two are basically ground products for use really based on market survey great thank you Okay, I'm going to go to James uh, next in case James has a question because uh, uh, I think he had one last time we didn't get to him. James, do you have any questions for uh, Jonathan? Yeah, uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, very professional presentation. So a, a couple of things here. I, uh, what I'm struggling with is what you want to be when you grow up. And, and I think I heard that you want to be a marketer. Um, so my, <laughs> que my question is twofold. One is... Um, have you looked at the Health Canada guidelines for potential claims that you want to make on this because they've got monographs, there's different things when it comes to what you're trying to do, um, um, NPN, uh, natural product numbers, etc. If you want to go into the drug thing, it, it, you know, it, it's a lengthy process. So that's one. Yeah, First yeah, question is, is, is Health Canada... I I, I, I would like to say, first of all, we're not going to sell into Canada. So even though we have okay. a Canadian thing in there, we are completely ignoring the Canadian market. And there's a couple of reasons for that. It's obviously a, a much smaller market than the United States market. Uh, you know, we can make more money just targeting California than we could the entire country of Canada. Okay. And we have more complications to enter. But regarding your, your, your question, uh, for one, we are aware of that. We have looked into it. We're actually modeling a lot of on the marketing side. Uh, how we package our products based on what we can do. And we have sought legal advice on that. What was your first question though? Because I think you had two. Yeah, well, it might, so my second question then is if, if, if the market, if you're going the marketing route. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And, so and, the, and, and I, I always ask this because I'm in consumer products. This is what I've been in for 30 years. One of the questions I always ask people with new products like this is if you walk down the, uh, um, the store aisle, um, do you have an idea of who they're going to pull off the shelf to put yours on there? Because it's real estate that um, you're going to be paying for. So um, I'm not expecting you to answer that now because you no, so, no, so that's early, a good but... question. And, and we, we've thought a lot about that. So um, there's, there's, it, we have more than one specific market. So the thing is on the, on the, um, on kind of the, the matcha grind product, that's really uh, direct. That's really kind of through Amazon and then paying 100,000 a month in, in basically marketing money. So the question is, your first question was, what do we want to be when we grow up? Uh, we thought originally when we started, we wanted to be farmers. And then we realized that we don't want to be farmers because doing the certification process and everything else and having the equipment is, is it, it, it won't work, you know, if we want to grow the company larger. Uh, so what we want to be is a, a company that basically contracts it out to organic farmers. And we want to have the special sauce, which is the mechanics, to do the mechanical separation, which allows us to be uh, basically dominant in the field. Because if you want to grow it, you can't separate it. Then, you know, how good is that going to be? And then on the back end of that, we want to be the place who has the market and the brand. Because one thing that, that came up quite often is that some people have been using Mullins. Some of it really wasn't working because of quality. Some of the quality of the product was was questionable certainly people were really concerned about the origin uh there there is no uh organic certified mullins that i can find in, in the united states or canada in north america and certainly we're in a, a perspective now of onshoring um where i want to be on the shelf is that again the grind product we're really going to predominantly sell online the, the drop is very different. It's a very different clientele. They're spending a lot of money. It's a huge market. That's a COPD market. And people told us there specifically that, you know, they wanted a candy because some of them wanted to buy it because it's, they, they have elderly parents who have COPD. They want to try it. It basically reduced their cost of medication. And it's very hard for them to give them tea. They're not going to have it. They, you know, they don't want to have that, but they can give them a candy because they're going to take it. Uh, where I'd like to be on the aisle is, you know, I would love to be in 7-Eleven. Um, and, you know, I would love to be that when you go pump your gas and you hear that really annoying announcement on the, on the gas station thing, because that's my client. My client is 55 blue collar worker who can't afford $485 a month in COPD meds. And they're paying 200 to 600 bucks. And it's crazy how much it is. And you might've seen in the um, caption, one of them's from MID, there was a guy who's getting a lung transplant who put it off after he started. Uh, Jonathan? 
Yeah, sorry. Uh, we just have time enough for sure. two brief sorry, sorry questions. I so I want to make sure the other judges get the questions in. We just have two minutes. So Deborah, go ahead and then Robert, and we'll have to conclude it then. I'll be quick. Um, have you thought about, uh, you've taught, think, thought about being a farmer? Have you thought about the kind of problems that you, like what will stop a farmer from, ex, from growing it for you? I have a couple of ideas, but um, what do you know about that? So we, we have thought about that a lot. I mean, it's, it's, not uh, from a mechanical standpoint. Um, I, by the way, I think most people are, are are just physically spreading it because you can't run it through a mechanical separator. So we are coating the seeds. Um, we're 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 incentivizing. We're paying them fifty percent down, basically up front. So we're modeling it after what they're going to do off a of corn because from a corn harvesting standpoint, they can use the same equipment. So we can do that. Um, we're they're worried 30, about reseeding. We only have thirty seconds left. Okay, we're, they're worried about reseeding because those little mullein seeds. But actually, if you till the soil. Uh, you can actually control it so it won't come back. Robert, quick question. Uh, there's lots of mullen products available on the market today, as well as Myriad Health um, products in the same area. How is yours different? Uh, they're teas because nobody's grinding it. And if you want to drink tea, you'll always have a competition, which is why I'm not doing a tea. So that the specifically tea bag, and if you want to take it and just soak the leaves in water, I'm never going to own that market but the market is big enough to do it. Most people don't want to drink tea every day. They find it, uh, they want to have it in some type of form factor they can add to their lifestyle. So we're trying to change the form of this plant to meet the customer demand profile and the lifestyle choices that they want to have. I'm going to call it there. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you, Judge, question. for your questions. Okay, on to next. Our next presenter is Kyle Gardner with Pick Assist from Line Systems. Mitchell, we turn it over to Kyle. Hi, I'm Kyle Gardner, product management lead with Line Systems and Pick Assist. Meet Chris Alonzo, president of Pietro Industries. He's a third generation mushroom farmer based in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. This small town is home to the highest concentration of mushroom farms in America and grows over 65% of the mushrooms consumed in the United States. He was quoted recently in an interview with Business Insider, stating he was losing about $50,000 to $100,000 in revenue a month. Despite his generations of expertise, this is due to the same massive challenge facing every mushroom farmer across the globe. Mushroom farms are simply unable to find and hire enough harvesters to pick their crop. In Canada alone, more than 23% of harvest is discarded due to lack of available labor. This represents more than $50 million in annual waste. And this problem is only getting worse. Job vacancy rate on Canadian mushroom farms rose from 9.7% in 2017 to almost 20% just two years later. This compounding problem for Canadian mushroom farmers is not only causing significant waste of product, but it's also crippling their ability to meet the growing demand for this universal commodity. For those unfamiliar with mushroom harvesting and its labor intensive nature, I'll describe the universal method that's currently used. Used. Mushrooms in commercial mushroom farms grow remarkably fast, doubling in size every 24 hours. That's growing at 4% an hour. This makes timing of the pick critical when har farmers are harvesting to target sizes for their customers. At mushroom farms, multiple grow beds are stacked on top of each other to grow as much as possible. Mushroom pickers stand on harvesting platforms, often like scissor lifts, in order to move around and reach the mushrooms located on higher beds. These harvesters use one hand to reach into the bed, identify the target size they're picking, and pick anywhere between one to three mushrooms, depending on how many they can hold. In the other hand, they have a knife, which they use to cut the stem of the mushroom before they place it into their tray. This process continues until that room is picked clean of mushrooms that fit their harvest target size. As anyone can tell, this labor-intensive method, coupled with the rapid growth of mushrooms, is continuing to cause major issues for mushroom farms. Realizing the magnitude of this problem, our team was inspired to create Pick Assist. Pick Assist is an automated mechanical device that allows mushroom harvesters to double or triple their harvesting efficiency, pick directly to accurately weighed containers to bypass packaging steps, and provide significant harvester data to farmers. With over a decade of experience working with mushroom farms, we know just how important simple solutions and careful handling is to this industry. Pick Assist allows mushroom harvesters to use both hands to pick the mushrooms, with the device carefully cutting the stem and placing it in the till. 
Containers are accurately weighed to the preset targets set by the supervisors, allowing the farm to bypass costly check weighing and packaging steps. This allows farms to reduce their labor requirement by over 50% while eliminating all of their harvest waste and increasing their production capacity. Picking directly to accurately weighed tills will also save approximately 70% of packroom labor cost. According to a report from Qualicat Research, the global mushroom industry was valued at $45.8 billion in 2020 and expected to reach $63.24 billion by 2027. This is a compound annual growth rate of 8.7% over the seven year span, largely driven by consumer demand. Growing vegan and vegetarian populations demanding protein rich meat substitutes have largely contributed to this growth. This, coupled with the public's recognition of mushrooms as a superfood due to their high nutritional content has supported this growing industry. We will initially be targeting our sales efforts to North American mushroom farms, starting first with farms in Ontario and British Columbia. This is because Ontario and BC make up 92% of the mushroom production in Canada, with Ontario producing 52% and BC producing the other 39%. For those wondering how specialty mushrooms fit into the mix, in Canada, regular button mushrooms still account for more than 95% of mushrooms produced. While this is such a large opportunity, it has remained an unsolved problem for so long due to the difficult nature of mushroom harvesting. Not only is it a bit of an art to identify the right target size mushroom to harvest, you must also be super careful because they're such a delicate crop. In regards to competition, while there's nothing commercially available yet, there are multiple companies that have turned towards robotics to solve this problem. While there's some excitement behind this method, there are some very obvious drawbacks. Primarily, robotic harvesting is much slower. In order to reach comparable rates, these robots have to harvest for 24 hours straight to meet production. This introduces its own issues, as now you will either have to have staff working at the farm overnight or farms have to spend even more money automating a solution to deal with the mushrooms that were picked overnight. Next is the fact that these robots are prohibitively expensive in comparison to our device. The other competition to pick assist is called the Game Changer. While this device has reached the market, it has its own challenges in that it doesn't easily fit to existing farm infrastructure. On top of requiring infrastructure and process change, the Game Changer doesn't work with existing harvest platform systems and requires purchase of their own lorry system. Finally, there are farms that have tried to implement a stem cutting conveyor along the side of the grow bed. This requires significant infrastructure change. In some cases, the building of a completely new farm. On top of this, these farms haven't figured out how to automatically get the mushrooms off the conveyor once the stems are cut. They have additional workers manually doing this job. With all the, these potential solutions available, everyone has issues that are significant enough to prevent industry-wide adoption. Picassist resolves all these issues and every farmer we have talked to has indicated they will buy Picassist before any of these others. This brings me to our significant competitive advantage of Picassist, its ease of adoption. Our small, modular, patent-pending device requires absolutely no infrastructure changes, no process changes, and no difficult training. Picassist simply straps onto your existing harvesting platforms and works with your harvesters to double or triple their efficiency all while costing the same as the annual salary of a picker. Our unique pricing strategy and revenue model contributes to our differentiation. As I've said, our device costs the same as a picker's annual salary, all while doubling or tripling their efficiency. For those doing the math, this represents a less than one year payback on each unit, made even easier to adopt by our monthly payment pricing strategy. By offering farms the option to pay off these units on a monthly basis, they don't require any changes to their existing operating costs. No extensive capital investment, and once the device is paid off, the farm's operating costs are cut in more than half. On top of this, we will also be providing the farm with a Pick Assist Cloud app, which will provide a host of other benefits to the farm that I'll describe next. The primary function of the Pick Assist application allows grow room harvesters to configure individual units or groups of Pick Assists for different picking scenarios. Beyond this, the application will provide farms with real-time tracking of worker rates in production, room harvest quantities, and production numbers for total harvest. As development continues, our software will offer advanced forecast analytics and data, allowing the farm to optimize labor usage and product yield.
With this conservative cost to the farmer in mind, the total available market in Canada is more than $36.5 million. Combining that with the United States, North America alone represents an opportunity of around $289.5 million. Beyond our initial three testing partners, we have other customers expressing interest that would represent approximately 600 additional units across Canada and the United States. With the $25,000 from this program, our team will be able to construct two pilot devices using our latest design. This is our third iteration of the device following two years of development and testing and represents the culmination of all of our learnings from our on-farm on testing with our three partners in BC and Ontario. Once built, these pilots will begin operating on these same partner farms full time in order to act as demos for the industry. In this close knit industry, word travels fast. Having two operating devices in these markets will allow us to build our case studies and develop the marketing materials required to expand across North America. Once these pilot devices are built, the hard work begins. We've received calls from farms across North America who are eager to see our demo units in operation and have verbally expressed intent to purchase once we complete development. We're looking forward to reaching these next milestones and are excited to share the rest of our journey with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Questions from the judges, and I see Tom's hand first. Go ahead, Tom. Well, that was uh, that was excellent. So uh, thank you for that. Um, just a, a couple of questions. The first one is um, around the 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 feel. So if I understand you, you're going to have the the latest prototype ready to go into uh the farm somewhere in july is that right um yeah thanks tom right now uh the stage that we're at we're hoping to place uh the final orders with our suppliers and the fabrication shops uh within the next couple weeks um the lead times and fabrication times are approximately a month to six weeks and then we will have to assemble the devices and begin testing but all of that together um approximately eight Eight to nine weeks from now is when we expect so, to be testing so these August, devices. So the the so, so the, the the bigger question is twenty five thousand dollars is not enough to get you all the way through that process and where you need to go in the iterations, etc. Um, how are you funded otherwise, and what's the relationship with Line? Uh, that's enough to pay for the parts and fabrication. So we'll be able to just pay for that part that portion of it. Yeah, but you've already, you've, already costs, ordered, you've already ordered the parts and the fabrication is going to happen. We haven't placed those orders yet. We're placing those in the next uh, week or two is, is the plan. Um, but right now, Pick Assist is a project of Line Systems. Uh, we've received, uh, we spent approximately $300,000 on this. Um, a lot of it is the big portion from IFPC and the BC Fast Pilot Program. Um, so we've received funding from NRC, IRAP, Innovate BC um, to support a lot so of this. Line, so is line, line's going line's to fund this? Line's funding it the rest of the way. The plan is for Pick Assist to branch out into its own company in the near future. Uh, but for the near future, yes, Line is supporting the production and development. Thank you. You're on mute, Mike. I guess that's Sandra. You're trying to go to Sandra. Sandra, go ahead. Thanks. Um, so you said the North American market was about 300 million. I'm curious. It, with the rest of the world, you know, would be? And then secondly, could you use the same device for another crop or could there be modifications done to the device in a fairly easy manner that could be then applied for other crops? Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll answer your first question first in regards to the global market value. Um, it's roughly, I think seven and a half billion. Um, the way we've calculated this is just looking at the total pounds of mushrooms grown, uh, the average picking rate of a human, the number of hours worked in a year, uh, therefore the number of workers required to pick that number of mushrooms. Um, yeah, it's, it's about 7.8 billion globally. Okay, and what about the application to other crops? Application to other crops, we're exploring how that can be used for specialty mushrooms because that is a growing area. Um, it absolutely could be adapted for other units as well. Uh, we're kind of exploring that, but there's a lot of other companies that are also focusing on robotic harvesting of other uh, greenhouse crops and fruits. 
Um, so we would kind of like to nail mushrooms before we spend too much time thinking about the other products. Great, thank you. Thanks. Deborah, go ahead. Thanks, Kyle. Um, great presentation. Um, I wasn't entirely sure exactly how the pick assist picks the mushrooms. Does the picker pick the mushrooms or does the, the pick assist pick the mushrooms? No, so that's where, um, um, but that's what makes our device so simple is it's still uh, worker harvesting. The, okay. the device simply assists the harvesters and allows them to pick two to three times faster um, by letting them use both hands to reach into the bed and just okay. to pick straight to the machine and the machine handles the rest. So it cuts the stems and then plops cuts them in the, the box. Okay. And places them in the accurately weighted tills. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any, any other questions? Yeah, I had a, I had a quick one around the around the revenue model. I didn't quite understand. Are we? Or when you said it was a year payback, that was to the farmer, to us. You're selling it. You're renting it. What's the What's the revenue model? Yes, that payback is to the farmer um, because the cost of the unit is the same as the annual salary of a picker. So if they're which picking, is, two, which is two, how much? Approximately thirty seven thousand. You annually, all right. Um, and so we're we're trying to offer it uh, in this monthly payment plan. We've explored a lot of different ways to do that. Um, there's sort of lease to own options. There's rent to own option. And then obviously, if these farms want to purchase them outright um, using their own capital, we're happy to do that because that simplifies things for us. Right. And and is it line? Who who's going to fix them when they break? Uh, we're providing warranties on them. Yeah, that would be line systems. Okay. Um. So yeah, the, the lease to own, rent to own, we've explored uh, opportunities with um, BDC and different banks. When we've got POs from customers, then that kind of supports the cash flow necessary to be providing these monthly payment options. So, so just one comment. Uh, yeah. I've seen a lot of other people who are trying to move to an annual subscription model with this exact kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it creates, it, it, there are a lot of benefits to that. I'm not sure if you've thought through it, you don't need to respond now, but it's an interesting, uh, opportunity there. Yeah, we, we, sh it's something that we've kind of considered, but in our customer discovery and talking to these farms, the fact that they end up owning this device and all of the gains go back to them once they've paid it off, um, yeah. are, it's a huge win for them. Uh, and it's such a quick payback that, uh, it kind of becomes a no brainer for them. Uh, once we start building them ourselves and offering the annual payment, we haven't explored how that would look from a revenue model. So we should, we'll spend more time digging into that. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Robert? Yeah, thank you. Um, Kyle, it seems like this is um, a product in, in the middle of uh, just there's straight labor or there's full robotic and there, you showed several systems and this is sort of in the middle. Um, my question, I guess, is, well, from the farmer's perspective, you've got to pay for the labor with using your machine, but you're saying he's more productive. Um, my question or concern is more the, the, the robotics companies, which I fully expect that robotics will come into mushroom picking and make sense. Um, it's a question of whether they, the, the farm would pick your system over more established players and whether more established players will for want of a better word, dumb down some systems, the full on um, systems that you talked about to more of a similar to yours. And then in what, and then if they've got their, the market already and, and established distribution, how do you compete? So that, that's where my concern is. Um, so I would, I would first kind of start by saying that with robotics, I agree with you. I think in the next three to five years, uh, that's kind of going to be the direction that all of the farms are going to be turning. Um, but unless any of these farms plan on having robotics in one or all of their farms within the next 16 months, then from a cash flow perspective, buying pick assist makes sense to the farm. Um, so that's kind of where we, we agree with the robotics. This is uh, a faster payback, no brainer alternative from a cash flow perspective for the farm, um, unless they plan on having robotics on their farm within the next 16 months. For the more established players, there is nothing on the market yet actually selling. Uh, everything's in R&D with the exception of that game changer. Um, and the game changer is still very new to the market. 
Um, and as I, I said before, it requires farm infrastructure change. They're very large devices and you have to purchase their harvesting platform, which comes with the whole unit. So you've got to swap out the infrastructure in your farm in order to adopt these things. We have time for one more quick question and I see David's hand up. So David, go ahead. Just following on to Robert's question. So would you say your niche area then is, is smaller players, um, both in the short and medium term? And, and I guess from that question, how many small players are versus larger players in BC and Ontario, for example? Yeah, so there's um, a handful of larger mushroom companies that represent the large mushroom organizations in Canada. Uh, there are countless contract farms which uh, independently run their mushroom farms and sell to these larger farms for packaging and marketing. Uh, those contract farms are definitely a huge part of our customer base. They're um, going to be the farms that aren't able to look towards these robotic solutions uh, and are desperately seeking this, are desperately having the same labor issues that the rest of the farms have. Um, but at the same time, these larger farms as well, uh, they don't expect to have robotics throughout their farm in the next three years. Uh, so they will both fit into our customer base, but certainly those smaller farms are a huge part of it. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, Mitchell, uh, we will be moving on now to Pippin Point and the presenter is Steve, Stephen Aaron. Stephen, you're up. Everyone, I'll let the video roll in a moment, but I just wanted to respectfully acknowledge that I am privileged to live and work on the traditional territory of the Tanaha Nation and the people of Yakunuki. Looking forward to your questions. Hi, I'm Stephen, founder of Pippin Point. I'm a mechanical engineer and machinist by trade, and I've been heavily involved in agriculture for nearly two decades. I'd like to briefly introduce a subcomponent of the business my team and I are currently working on. So I spent last year building a food hub designed to develop and economically mass produce value add products from a range of agro waste streams, then distribute them into the retail environment. Working that position highlighted a problem that my team and I also faced while developing our cider and winery. Packaging is a major barrier to market. So with that in mind, we developed a packaging format carefully tailored for the unique needs and scale of small producers. With this, we're looking to address two of the primary issues faced by businesses looking to sell and scale a product, branding and production costs. So the backstory behind all this. My family's farm had been producing bulk cider inputs for a half dozen land-based wineries and breweries around Western Canada. And when the lockdowns happened, that business slowed right down, leaving them with around 20,000 liters of perishable product and no ready market. We decided to partner with a local winery and sell it retail ourselves. But at the time, it actually proved pretty much impossible to get around a packaging manufactured and imported from our usual suppliers. So, I hopped online and found an interesting, if prohibitively expensive option. In bulk from Eastern Europe, they could laser cut lots of 100 boxes for around $17 per unit plus freight. Got to thinking and looked at the actual materials involved and thought, you know, if we could make them in sufficient quantities, our price might actually be comparable to the cardboard boxes we'd hope to use. I grabbed some plywood from the local mill went into my prototyping machine shop, CNC'd up a few hundred wooden boxes, and got the cider into three stores. The first 1,000 liters sold out in a couple of weeks. We had a hit. People were buying the cider just to get their hands on the boxes, then coming back and asking for refills. So in an effort to scale up production to support our internal needs, I spent the next couple of weeks putting together a CNC router designed around these boxes, developing a software plugin that let us customize them rapidly, and got to work on optimizing the key to all of this, manufacturing them economically. Over the last 7,000 units, we have systemically increased production efficiency and are finally able to produce these boxes out of locally sourced plywood at a cost comparable to mid-run cardboard, with far more flexibility for customization. So. I was initially hesitant to bring this product to market, as in addition to working 10 hours a week at the now operational Kootenai Farms Food Hub and other contract work, my primary focus is developing a clear-cut mountainside into a destination cidery, winery, and bistro. 
We're putting a lot into this unique farm, and the boxes have represented a pretty compelling market differentiator for the wine and cider that is going to be produced from the fields we're in the middle of planting, helping to fund a lot of the more intriguing techniques we're trialing. Participating in IEF's ramp-up program changed my mind, and I decided to see about offering custom boxes to users of our food hub trying to get their own products off the ground. That initial offering resulted in significant interest, and we've actually had to pause taking additional orders. Through the smaller runs, users are finding they're achieving quicker revenue growth and better positioning their product with a premium valuation, all for a relatively small 4 to 8% increase in per unit costs over the alternatives, often with much lower upfront investment. Now, operating as a small business, we're currently making the baseline 3 liter box at an internal cost of $2.30 per unit. And we're making a solid profit reselling them for $3.50 to $4.50 each. This is an order of magnitude and difference with a comparable product and lets us compete directly with single use alternatives. The local marketplace alone has enough demand to keep one employee busy year round operating the single machine. But in order to offer this product regionally and across the province, we need to increase efficiency, compensating for the added costs. That means taking the lessons learned from operating our current custom CNC machine and building a second generation unit. It should be able to nearly double what that same employee can manufacture in a day and lowering the per unit cost to around the $2 mark. With that level of baseline production, we can begin to adequately supply significant portions of the easily addressable market and develop more lucrative export options. So that's where we currently stand. The numbers on this project do make sense. Supply chain dependencies are a problem that just aren't going away, and this has the potential to enable a lot of downstream benefits if we can set up the business to succeed. That's it. The basics. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Stephen. Judges, questions? Let me have a look who we got here. Sandra, go ahead. Okay, thanks. So um, I just wanted to clarify, your, pro your product is a box that you're going to use, and you're also selling to third parties, is that correct? Uh, primarily, yes. Okay. And then this box, I wasn't sure because you had different pictures. Is it one had like the bottle inside the box and the other one had like the nozzle. So is it is it both or is it one of those? Yeah, so really what we're doing here is um, we develop a way to economically turn plywood into a wide variety of boxes. So um, I've got a software program that I wrote and basically we plug into the basic parameters into the program, um, import any graphics that we want to integrate into the boxes. And then it does the old programming, the optimization automatically, and we can just hit basically print and off goes a sheet of plywood into whatever size and type of box that we need. So we can do very small lots quite quickly and efficiently for people wanting to do custom boxes or wanting to have every single one of their boxes be different. It's quite easy to do and doesn't cost us any extra. Gotcha. And then the ROI that you talked about, like the, the value that you provide the third parties, is that because of the lower price point? Um, honestly, it's because their product sells out in these boxes. Um, it's very easy for them to get into a store. They show up with the box. It makes it so nice display and people tend to buy whatever's in them just to get their hands on the boxes. Um, because we're able to offer the boxes quite closely in cost to the cardboard that they would be using otherwise and keeping them from having to go out and say do a production run of 10,000 units just to get something that's branded for them, like we're doing for a lot of other people and what we have been doing in the past, it means that instead of putting up front 30 grand just to get a product off the line, they can put up two or three and test it, get it out into market and then decide how you want to scale it. Great, thank you. James Pratt, go ahead. Tom was up before me, I think, Mike. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Tom. It, it all depends uh, okay. on the screen no, how I look at it. Good. I thought he just liked you better, James. But the but the <laughs> the so so a question. First of all, Stephen, I I think it's awesome, right? Necessity is the mother of invention. I think you guys have done a very very cool thing here. Um, the question I have is really about the scaling. I mean, are you you are you going to make this? Are you going to make it a hobby or are you going to make it a business? And and so as you think through that. Are you are you trying to do a lot of people who are having challenges finding you know they don't they're not big enough to have the supply chain da 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 da, da 
or are you trying to find somebody who's going to order 30,000 units? What, what's your, what's your, what's your approach as to how you, how you scale this? Okay. So uh, there's a couple of ways we're doing that. One is yes, this needs to be somewhat spun off into a separate business. Um, right now we're doing about 50,000 of these cardboard boxes a year. Um, just out of our small community, there's about 5,000 people in the town, 10,000 in the area. Um, honestly, we could replace every single one of the, those with the wind boxes if we had manufacturing in place to do that. So right now we're targeting the farmers that are doing 10 to 15,000 units a year. Those are the people that have jumped on and done orders of three to 5,000 units for this first year. And I think that's the reliable market. Right, um, but you're not you're not looking for somebody who's going to who's going to order two hundred thousand of these things every year. You're you're not looking for no. that. Okay. What we're looking for is a farm or somebody a producer doing you know between three hundred thousand and six hundred thousand dollars a year in sales. Um, beyond that, they have the capability to go to the manufacturer and order a hundred thousand dollars worth of packaging, and we're not going to compete with that on a value basis. On a premium product basis, it's still there, but. That's kind of where what I see would, our what would another What would another CNC machine cost you? I mean, what's that next chunk of investment required to scale? Uh, so I built this one in about two weeks for roughly $6,500. Um, if I was to add a second unit into this facility um, beyond my actual primary unit that I use for my actual business, um, it's going to be right around $7,000 in input costs and probably about a week of time putting it together. Thank you. Go ahead, James. Uh, yeah, this is pretty cool. I really, really like this when I just read the one pager. My concern is there's zero barriers to entry on this thing. Have you thought about how you can protect yourself on this and whether it's, you know, Canadian pine beetle wood or whatever, but I, I'm just, uh, you know, as soon as this is a success, you're going to get some of these other guys that have got five CNC uh, equipment that are sitting idle to say, this is a good idea. I want to jump into it. So talk to me a little bit about overcoming the uh, low barriers to entry on this thing. Yeah. Um, so the barrier to entry is relatively low. You're right. Where our initial costs in actually running these things were close to $5 a box. Where we have an advantage is we've run enough to really dial this thing down. Um, and we have a base production for our internal use. There is the potential to patent something involved with the software. Um, I was involved in numerous patents when I was younger working for larger companies. I know how you work around them. They're quite easy to work around. I don't see that being the primary barrier. Where we have an advantage is right now we're running pretty close to the cost of the material and we're able to get our material for quite a bit cheaper than anyone outside of our local area because we're going straight to the mill and getting lifts of lumber basically at the cost. So if we can scale up where we're buying basically an entire logging trucks worth of lumber in one go, um, no one's going to be able to beat us on the input cost. But um, it is plausible for people to take this and expand. People have been building similar products, but if you notice currently, they're building them and it's an order of magnitude more cost than what we're able to do. So I don't see a large cardboard manufacturer investing in a major facility to do the same thing, but it's certainly an option. It's certainly possible. Um, that's where the customization and smaller scale of this come in. Thank you. Tom? Do you have a secondary question? I have a quick one, and then just it's really just a comment, right? I mean, I think you're looking at this correctly, um, but the other area where there is is branding, right? I mean, it is it is branding that box and and trying to take that space. Um, it's hard, it's complicated, but uh, it's worth thinking about. Thanks, Tom. Deborah, go ahead. Following up on that, um, Stephen, what if you got an order from a, an organic winery in, in California for 20, 30,000 boxes? That would currently take me about two months to make with the current setup. Okay. Um, and that is an employee in there running it. Um, I now have it down to the point where we can train someone coming in. The last employee doing it, it took roughly six hours of training and they were making boxes at 90% of my efficiency. 
So it is rapidly scalable from that standpoint. So it's still, still an option to scale then? Yeah, very much so. Um, even just the Kootenai market, we're talking about 70,000 three liter bag in a box, let alone other forms of packaging. The global packaging market is close to $900 billion. Um, we're obviously not looking to take on large portions of that, but I see this very much tackling a niche within BC for export products for high-end premium products where we're able to customize the branding of each individual box. Thank you. Okay, I am not seeing any further questions. So thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you. Our next presenter is Alicia Vandergrat from Quantotech. Alicia. Hello. Um, first off, I would just like to acknowledge that Quantotech's offices are on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, tsleil and Stolo Nations. And we thank those Indigenous people who still live on and take care of these lands. Uh, you can go ahead and start the video. Hi, I'm Alicia Vandergrat, founder of Quantotech Solutions a vertically integrated vertical farming company. Quantotech designs, manufactures, and operates micro farms to promote food security and sustainability in Canada. Quantotech manufactures our micro farm, the Q Farm here in BC. Food security is becoming an increasingly large problem in Canada and all over the world due in part to the increasing amount of climate emergencies. Small, remote communities are especially at risk of being cut off from their fragile supply chains. Some remote communities don't even have access to fresh produce throughout the year, regardless of any unforeseen events. On top of this, the majority of small communities do not have ex access to experts in food production. Current solutions involve flying in food during supply chain interruptions at a high cost. Container farms also offer a potential solution. However, container farms are a large undertaking for a small community in both cost and the amount of produce produced. Our solution is the Q Farm. The Q Farm is a small eight by 12, highly automated plug and play micro farm. The Q Farm empowers small remote communities to grow fresh produce within the community at the cost of imports or better. The small size and automation allows a community without a skilled laborer to operate it at a low cost. Quantotech also offers grant writing support to help our customers get the equipment at no cost. We also offer ongoing support through remote monitoring to ensure our customers are successful. Unlike our competition, such as freight farms, grocer, or cubic farms, the Q farm can be viable and productive on a smaller scale, more suitable for small and remote communities. At around 100,000 Canadian, we also offer a less expensive entry point for those overwhelmed by both the size and undertaking of a full 40 foot container system. Quantotech operates our own vertical farms in large communities where we sell the produce for profit using the same technology used in the Q farm. Our competitors are equipment manufacturers looking to reduce their cost of goods, whereas we are farmers looking to reduce our operating expenses while improving production. And we're able to pass this knowledge onto our customers through the Q Farm. Our target customer community size has a population of 5,000 or less. And there are a couple thousand of these small and remote communities in Canada. This creates a total Canadian market of over 1,500 Q Farms or $150 million at 100,000 per farm. We predict the total addressable market to be approximately 50 million and our year one goal consists of half a million dollars. We are in revenue, which comes from both equipment sales and recurring revenue from consumables and monitoring support. We access our customers through strategic partnerships such as the Mission Community Skills Center, Agriculture Canada, the First Nation Health Authority, as well as partners with existing ties to these small communities. Access to these communities has typically been a barrier of entry to those without existing relationships. However, our strong partnerships have helped us work around this. We have spoken to many customers and potential customers and have validated a significant concern about food security 
and know these communities are actively looking for a suitable solution. Although our product is very new, opposed to our more established competitors, the QuantoTech team has decades of experience in equipment manufacturing, and more recently, about a decade of experience in the vertical farming industry. We understand the pain points from both an equipment manufacturing perspective, as well as a farmer. We are able to keep our IP secure by building our algorithms and grow recipes into our firmware. We are also pursuing patents on our equipment design. We have spent approximately 2.5 million to date, of which 1.5 million was raised and 1 million was from grants. We are looking for 3 million in equity to pair with 3 million in debt for scale up over the fall and winter. Due to supply chain issues affecting a broad range of industries, part of this funding will go towards risk buying our essential and long lead time components. In summary, QFARM gives small communities increased food security on a smaller footprint. QuantoTech can help provide these communities with up to full funding for their QFARMs. QuantoTech's technology allows anyone to grow produce on par or superior to what is available at a grocery store at the same cost or better. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. We open for questions. And James, I see you first. Uh, yeah, interesting concept. So, um, could you talk a little bit about that, like the distribution channel, like who who you're selling to? Again, I might have missed it, and uh, I heard you mention a hundred k. Like, what's kind of an ROI, or how many years payback is that going to be for the buyer? Yeah, so that's uh, profitable in the second year. Um, assuming we work with them on the grant applications, we've identified one uh, that covers 75% of their costs, and uh, we've already developed a template to easily um, sign them up for it. And uh, we are working with talking to the grant distributor uh, just so that they can get to know our product and uh, just help with the application process. Right. And who, and who are you selling to? Like, who's the buyer? So these are small communities. Um, we have a lot of First Nation communities that are looking to purchase and other small communities, also uh, mining companies, anyone um, that's kind of smaller than the 5,000 person mark. Okay, so, so I'm just trying to figure out how you get to that market. Yeah, so that's through our, we already have 10 First Nation uh, um First Nations uh, looking to sign up in British Columbia, and that was identified through the First Nations Health Authority. Um, okay. They're just waiting for our initial uh, proof through our testing with Ag Canada. Okay, thank you. Jim, Robert. I love the idea and the concept, and congratulations getting the first one out. Uh, I think it makes a ton of sense for remote communities to grow their own food. And uh, this is a way to do it. Uh, up north in particular, that's great. Um, I'm curious, I, I think, uh, you know, leveraging grants makes sense. It's, it's only going to get so far, of course, depending on the grant program. And I'm curious about how that is. Uh, if, if you don't have a grant, does it become harder um, to, to justify? And then secondly, is there an opportunity to create businesses for people uh, to become their own farmers in these remote communities selling their own produce. Yeah, that uh, definitely is part of the goal. And that's where we're teaming up with, um, uh, who was it? Um, the, they just developed the food hub down in Mission. So they want to do basically instructor courses that help people that want to be vertical farmers, micro farmers, set up their own businesses. So that's that partnership. Um, we also have been talking to grocery stores. They're showing interest, wanting to place these um, just in their parking lots. Uh, but right now, our focus is definitely the small communities. There's, and they really do have access to quite a few grants. Um, of course, the more that covers, the better it is. But even if you didn't have a grant whatsoever, um, you'd be looking at uh, payback in five years. Okay. Deborah, go ahead. Alicia, nice to see you. <laughs> yep. Um, I, I was also going to ask about the small business opportunity for remote communities, um, but but it's been answered. But I have another question about um, what what kind of produce 
does it, what is the range of produce that, that the, the units produce? And are those the kind of products that First Nations or Northern communities want? Yeah, so. You probably looked into this. <laughs> yeah, well, we also did some testing um, down uh, with Chechen when the flooding was happening and got a lot of positive results there. Um, and that was with a variety of lettuces. We also vetted arugula and cilantro. Um, of course, we're working on strawberries like everyone else, as well as uh, going after a grant for tomatoes, cherry tomatoes on a smaller scale. Um, so we are actively going after a whole bunch of different crops. Uh, Walmart has interest in okra. Um, the good thing about our system is that it's really now after the, all the work we've done, it's really about plugging in the grow recipes. Um, so the lighting requirements, the nutrient requirements, and that's uh, really easy to do. We've developed a program that you just upload it and uh, the controller takes care of the rest. And uh, just from a partnering standpoint, I have also, I do get uh, a lot of interest from uh, people just reaching out and looking for a partnership or, or looking to start their own business. Um, we're always looking to uh, see how we can help them out, but definitely our focus is more remote and more rural right now. And what about height of crops? Is it limited by the system or can you, is that adjustable as well? It's adjustable within reason. You're definitely not going to have a, a meter tall plant in there and have a good payback, but mm -hmm. uh, it is ad adjustable within reason. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Hi, Alicia. Um, question, the, the eight by 12, the, the smallness of it, um, it still seems quite small to me, even for a, you know, a 5,000 person community. Does it, does it eight, eight, eight by 12 actually support a 5,000 person community? Or is it just that the 40 foot container is too complicated, too big, and it's too expensive? No, well, we can uh, grow up to 900 heads of lettuce per month. Um, it is pretty significant. People aren't eating salads for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, so we, we figure that's good enough. Um, we also could add a second one for some of the closer to 5,000 size locations. Okay. And, and, and this was, this was the, maybe to the, to the, to the business opportunity, but right now the model is who's, who's actually purchasing the unit and how does the food get to the people who eat it? Yeah. So it's grown directly in there in the community. So normally for some of the first stations that we've worked with, they have hamper programs. Um, so they're already distributing food within their community. So it just jumps on with that. Um, yeah, it, it depends on the application. Um, but ge generally just, the, the, gov the government, the local government would buy one? Yeah, in the case for First Nations, um, in the case of small communities, it would be looking more like a grocer. Um, and then they would already have a storefront. Got it. Robert, I'm still seeing your hand up. Do you have a supplementary question? Oh, okay, no problem. Uh, am I missing any questions? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Alicia. Thank you. Our final presentation tonight is on Nativus, and our presenter is Rhonda Milliken. Rhonda, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you for hanging in there till the end. Um, I look forward to your questions. Maybe we'll just go forward with the video. Hi, my name is Rhonda Milliken. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm an ecologist with a serious love of wine. I combine environmental science, horticulture, and soil biology to eliminate chemicals and thus make the viticulturalist's job easier and help the vineyard owner leave a legacy for the next generations of humans and wildlife. We serve vineyard owners who need to reduce the insecurity of climate change impacts on vineyard production. Nativus is a certified vineyard management process that harnesses native plant exudates and ecosystem services of native wildlife for a self-sustaining solution without chemicals. The difference is detectable 
as the native terroir, please refer to nativist.ca. The big problem we solve, wine growers are experiencing escalating land and production costs under increasingly brittle growing conditions. They need solutions that are sustainable. Nativist harnesses nature to restore soil and grapevine health without the chemical treadmill. We provide a wine growing process with science-based procedures, evaluations, and outcomes that are certifiable. The result is distinguishable in the market as a native terroir. Our solution to the big problem, our step change is the native terroir beyond organics, biodynamics, and regenerative agriculture. We use nature for resilience to climate change. We integrate the proven benefits of each practice for vineyards, no till, no chemicals, restoration of soil, biology, nutrient inputs from animals, and then uniquely we harness the resilience of native plant exudates and the ecosystem services of native wildlife species at risk, bird, bat, amphibian, reptiles, for a self-sustaining solution. Rather than fight nature, we enhance it. Our process is to initially grow microorganisms in a vineyard specific compost, extract the brew, spray it carefully so the organisms remain alive and provide organic matter to keep the soil cool. We restore both the below and above ground food webs for ecosystem sustainability. So why should the panel care? Well, you can see from this slide, many insects, and this is what's happening with climate change. The ranges and uh, populations are increasing with climate change weather conditions. So globally, governments are spending millions to solve climate change. We can solve it and produce quality fruit that is healthy. Wine is food, isn't it? The secret is in the fungi. In just the top six soil, six inches of soil by restoring natural microbiology we can sequester five to eleven tons of carbon per hectare per year no carbon offset program can achieve that regenerative agriculture isn't enough we need ecosystem sustainability beyond the no-till beyond the no chemicals beyond improved soil biology we need native plants and wildlife species at risk not livestock that has to be tended we can leave a legacy. Oops. So why will I succeed? If we look at the media globally and across Canada and uh, listen to some of the, the people, the consumers and the clients, what we hear is that ecosystem sustainability is required. The global wine magazines recognize the need for sustainability. Consumers want to purchase products that are environmentally friendly based on customer interviews. Vineyard owners and staff want to contribute towards a legacy based on client interviews. And in reading the Organics Associations and the uh, Vancouver Sun, the approach must be science-based with defined processes, evaluations, and outcomes that can be audited by government for certification. We will need a standard and a symbol that recognizes certified producers working at a high level of sustainability across the country. The nose and palate of the native terroir will be marketable based on corporate and tasting room market people I have spoken with. This is part of our team and uh, some examples of our science-based approach. We focus on grapevine health by adding biology, not chemicals. And you can see an example of the application. Whoops, on the left. Not sure why that's not playing. Here we go. I'll see if I can get it to play now. Oh, goodness. There we go.
So for the market, the about 10,000 acres of wine contributes 2.8 billion per year to the BC economy. From, 12 to, from 2012 to 2016, wine exports increased 26% to 9.7 million and continue to grow. A wine contract is about 18,000 per year for vineyard management. My customer is the vineyard owner and their staff, the viticulturalist and the marketing team. The value proposition I'm offering is improved quality of fruit at a reduced cost. They will buy it for health, taste, joy, and personal integrity reasons. The buying process is contracting, training, workshops, and certification, and the target market is BC and the Canadian wines. So for the distribution, the value chain that I'm offering is a core technology of soil and plant health. The standalone product is database instructions and standards. The product is integrated through certification and government incentives. The consumer solution is a consultant package with workshops, audit checklists, and outputs. And this together gives us ecosystem sustainable wine growing. Thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you, Rhonda. And Tom, go ahead. Hi, Rhonda, thank you for that. Um, two, uh, two, one, one, just to be clear, the, 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 the revenue model, is it that you are charging the grower $17,950 a year, or how do you, how do you get paid from the grower? Yeah, there are a couple of um, ways of doing it. That's just an example um, contract. Uh, so it's either through being contracted by the individual vineyard or through workshops to teach the staff at the vineyard. And ultimately that's what happens that I won't be doing it myself, that I'll be um, training them how to do it, but it's, it's the approach that I'll teach them and then the other um, money earning is through auditing through the certification process. Okay. And, and, and one of the big value drivers that I thought I heard was around the quality of the fruit and, and assumedly then the quality of the wine. Um, how, do you, how do you measure that? Yeah, so um, I'm still doing the, the pilot verification with the, with, um, uh, BCB tax, so they will um, have a sommelier panel test the results from the conventional with the biology and with the biology of native plants at from the four vineyards that I'm working with and blind panel and chemistry test to uh, because it's really hard to get uh, winemakers to say what is quality so it has to be <laughs> yeah, it has to be determined independently through a sommelier panel thank you and uh, deborah go ahead thanks rhonda um i love your approach <laughs> but i i worked with farmers for a lot of years and when it comes right down to it, they say, well, if this cost me $10, am I going to make $10 out of it? Even if they really, really want to do it properly, how can you, uh, are they, are, is it going to be a hard sell? I mean, I know that you've probably got four who are, are your progressive growers right now. Um, how do you sell it to the others? I've actually had quite a few vineyards approach me, but I'm, I'm trying to do it in a controlled uh growth and um it's it, the way i i see it um being particularly attractive to the vineyards is through a shared economy uh so it's a hub type of approach so the the compost and the electric sprayer that i'm using they're shared the brewer everything is is shared between uh, a, a hub of vineyards and so i have a a second hub that I'll be working with um, next year. So uh, I'm working in with uh, a corporate, three corporate vineyards and one boutique. And so it, it, it actually seems to be fine for, for both sizes. 
Okay, and do you see it extending out past the Okanagan Valley? Yes, yes. Um, the Andrew Peller Limited is is the main uh, corporate group, and they have their vineyards in Ontario. So that that'll be uh, the next um, the next area to, to do it in, and then. Um, and I'd probably jump straight to Australia and um, Africa, South Africa. Those would be my preferences, uh, not, not the US. Can I ask why? <laughs> uh, well, I've, I've had experience before. Um, I, I have my, another company, Echo Truck, and uh, uh, my experience is that even though I have a technology that is unique, it's very difficult to sell in the US. Um, that's just been my experience. So I'm not even gonna try that, so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Go ahead, Sandra. Thanks, so I'm curious what you'd be replacing. So if, meaning if they're gonna, if they're not using you, what would they be using? Uh, I'm replacing chemicals. So, uh, so no, um, no uh, chemicals for powdery mildew, for example, no glyphosate for weed control, no, um, no uh, chemical fertilizers. And if they're, would there be any appetite if they're not using chemicals? Because they're value for those farms that are already considering non-chemical growth? It, it's also through the the attraction of the wildlife into the vineyard because the wildlife provides nutrients that calcium, magnesium, zinc to the vineyard plus uh, eats pests. So you get the pest management services from, from the wildlife that are attracted in with the native plants. So that's the other reason. Plus the, uh, what I've found is that the public or members of the vineyards are really keen on this as well and the vineyard workers love love working with it so it's it's um, brings more joy and um i think uh sustainability for as as the vineyard owners have they, they want to leave a legacy for their kids and their grandkids and so that this addresses that as well thanks okay jim uh yeah, a good presentation, but very, very cool. Um, so this might sound a bit crass, but talk to me about the scalability here, because it sounds like this is just you, and you can't travel to Africa and Ontario, et cetera, et cetera. Is there something that you can put in a box for someone like me who knows nothing about like what you're doing as a, as a consultant so that there's a succession that, and here's the crass part, if you get hit by a bus, that the business can continue? Yes, it it uh, it totally is um, doable by other people. I I just need to train them. That's it. That's that's the uh, scalability, and um, they're uh, with the certification process. Then the the processes, outcomes, evaluations are all auditable. So that's done by somebody else. Doesn't have to be me. Anything further, Jim? Okay, David, go ahead. Well, thank you, Rhonda, In interesting um, presentation. Um, I just had a question. Uh, when somebody adopts your, your approach and they move away from conventional approaches, how long does it take to, to get to a point where um, they have some return for, for that investment? There's the immediate uh, return of not using certain chemicals uh, perhaps, but how long does it take for the, the vineyard itself to start to assume uh, these new biological um, outcomes? Yeah, um, well, currently it's with, within the season uh, and the costs, I'm, I'm working out the exact numbers. So I, don't, I can't say how much we're saving them at this point, but without using um, the, the chemicals without the labor of applying the chemicals without the tractors, the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this is an electric vehicle that I'm using to apply. Um, so all of those cost savings, I, I can't give numbers just yet. Thanks. And what are the, the barriers to 
conversations with producers and um, viticulturalists to, to assuming this uh, novel approach, uh, letting go of tried and true approaches, they understand them completely. What's what are the challenges there? Yeah, it's it's uh, powdery mildew and and growing in sand. Those are the two <laughs> biggest uh, limitations, and um, and that's what I'm that's what I'm handling. So it's it's a it's a trust, you know, uh, um, letting me uh, prove to them that it is doable. But there there is uh, there is for sure a, a, a challenge to to show them. But my experience has been that they they really do want to do this. It's it's um, I hope I answered that. Okay. Okay. Uh, one last question to Deborah. So, um, Rhonda, do you think this is, is just an idea that is finally matured? Because I, I, I'm getting that sense that um, the growers are more open than they used to be, especially with the, the uh, perennial crops, because I mean, it's, it's, it's a better place to be than an annual crop, especially for climate change. Um, talk yeah, about that a little I, bit. I really do think it's, it's um, a combination of, of, of forces all coming together and, and it's, um, it's the people who wanna buy the wine. So it's the public, it's the members of the vineyards, it's the staff that are working there and it's the um, our learning of how the below ground and above, above ground food webs work, um, that we can now look at ecosystem sustainability. We can piece it all together. So yeah, I, I agree. I think it's just perfect uh, time. <laughs> so Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rhonda. Uh, that is the end of our time. I would ask uh, all of the presenters to, to leave and thank you so much for your presentations and all of your hard work that was obvious on display tonight. Thanks again. And any judges that can stay for a few minutes, I would appreciate that.